continuate about rationalism and empiricism. <clears throat> In a former lecture, I already mentioned that there is a division in modern philosophy between so-called rationalists and uh, empiricists. This division is extremely vital because it determines the basic principles with which the human mind or with which the ability to think in humans is governed, is determined. Briefly speaking, rationalism means that human mind is radically different from sense data, from sense givens only. And the human mind is capable of discovering not only what is given immediately in experience, in sense perceptions, but by its very nature, human thought is transcendent. That means that the human mind can reach and solve the most fundamental questions in philosophy which were, which were discussed from the very beginning. As we said before, as I said before, philosophy is a search for meaning. And the question of the nature of the universe, the question about the possible existence of God, the nature of man, and man's final destiny are the crucial questions in any serious philosophizing. The rationalist therefore believes that the human mind is capable of solving those problems. And from the very beginning of philosophy until almost 17th century, it was never questioned. The human mind was, so to speak, supreme. With the development of the horizon of the human mind, coming into existence of modern science, and the, the lessening or diminishing of religious authority, we have a gradual leaning in many philosophers, not all, but many, towards so-called empiricism. Basically, empiricism is denying any kind of transcendence to the human mind. Knowledge is possible, but knowledge is limited and encapsulated within the data of senses. Everything that deserves knowledge, according to empiricists, must be based on some sense datum, some sense experience. And otherwise, the questions, the fundamental questions traditionally accepted in philosophy as basic become uh, gradually doubted very much and finally negated. 
In other words, human beings can know things about the universe in which they live, the laws of nature, and they can develop scientific theories which elucidate to a great extent understanding of the situation of man. But we must remember that with this encapsulation in and within the sensible, sensibly accept, acceptable, available data, the nature of human life, the very nature of man himself, and human destiny is radically different. Ultimately, it comes to the question of God's existence, the nature of the human spirit or soul, even about its very existence, and the possibility of some sort of existence after physical death. Now, empiricists deny that those questions can be solved in any solid, evident, rational way. And the reason, the reason is that all knowledge has to be based finally on the evidence of sense datum, of sense experience. So, the fundamental questions are going beyond what the now and the here sense datum gives me. Consequently, man is not able to answer those so-called fundamental questions I mentioned. This division is still existing until this very day, until our times. We have a number of scientists who deny any possibility of solving the question, for example, of God's existence. Although different sciences developed in many areas and gradually develop more and more, questions of God, immortality, meaning of life, final destiny of man, and the ultimate nature of the universe are simply put aside. We must live within the data of sense data here and now. So, Usually in history of philosophy, Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz are mentioned as classic rationalists, so to speak. Although in a way, the very beginnings of philosophy would have to be included here too. Also, especially thinkers like Plato, Aristotle, the Arabic thinkers, some of them, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, if we take such divisions seriously, would be on the side of, rather on the side of rationalism. Modern philosophy, as mentioned already, 
begins with Descartes. Descartes lived between 1596 to 1650. After him, Spinoza, a pantheist, 1633 to 1677, and Leibniz, 1646-1716. All of those people were, the three persons mentioned just, were believers. However, Spinoza, Although he was called God intoxicated man to any serious in within any serious uh, evaluation would be a pantheist. And it is pantheism to a great extent uh, does not really differ very much from uh, practical atheism. Descartes was a believer. According to Descartes, <coughs> he could prove the existence of God by so-called ontological argument. From the very notion of God, God conceived as absolutely perfect being, that is, infinitely perfect being, in the hierarchy of beings, from crude matter, through living things in this world, through humans, intelligence, uh, intelligent people, the highest substance, the highest being is the most perfect God. Now the concept God means that what exists is certainly more perfect than just a concept or a notion of something. A perfect being, therefore, must exist because existence is the foundation of all perfections. So God on top, the substantial God being God, eternal existent, existent God and then comes the so-called time beings or transitory beings called sometimes also contingent beings which receive existence exist for a while and disappear Finally, down from man through different forms of life, lower, to crude matter, inanimate matter. And we have a whole picture, a hierarchy of different so-called substances. The peak substance is God. Once the question of God for Descartes was settled, he is trying to build on it the whole system of his philosophy. Our knowledge is essentially based for Descartes, once again, on the already mentioned principle, I think, therefore I am, the famous cogito ergo sum. Because Descartes was looking for some fundamental fact, some fundamental reality which cannot be doubted. He wanted to find some foundation on which to build the whole edifice of whole philosophy, to explain the whole universe including God. And, according to Descartes, this is precisely what it is. I think. Thinking is the primary, indubitable, unavoidable 
beyond any possibility of doubt, fact which escapes any kind of criticism or doubt. Even if I doubt whether I exist or not, I still have to think because doubting is a form of thinking. So on this foundation, Descartes built his philosophy. He introduced also the second fundamental knowledge in his philosophy, the precise and clear ideas, definitions. Whatever admits possibility of doubt is rejected. Precise, clear ideas are those which are accepted as beyond any possibility of doubting. Three, number three, he Descartes introduces the mathematical method and geometrical method into the scientific inquiry. Mathematics became the very tool and the very foundation of rapidly developing different specific sciences. Descartes, therefore, is in a way a cornerstone of what we call modern philosophy. However, the, there is a lot of possible difficulties to question when it comes to his system. First of all, the argument for God's existence has been criticized very much. It is nothing new. It was very old, going back even to Anselm. It's so-called ontological argument, and this argument is really not valid, because from the concept alone, I cannot infer existence I may have an idea of something that does not exist. And the concept of all-perfect God, which according to Descartes proves that God exists, is uh, not sufficient to really come to the conclusion that God is real that all-perfect God de facto exists. From an idea, from a bare idea, mere idea, to, real, uh, to existence, there is no transition. We also must remember that Descartes took, after establishing the existence of God, and the fundamental question, uh, problem, uh, fact, of thinking. He, in his meditations, mentions that God, we have to believe into our ability to think, into our knowing, because God, being all good, would not deceive us. Neither would it be, would he allow that some demon or some so-called malus genius, bad genius, some sort of a devil would be able and have the power to deceive, to confuse the human mind. In other words, God becomes the guarantor of true knowledge. And in this there is a kind of circularity in Descartes' thinking. Nevertheless, Descartes had a very deep influence, exercised a very deep influence, and he, in a definite way, inaugurated a new way of 
philosophizing. All authority at the beginning is rejected. The individual must solve the problems by himself. Authority can be accepted, but not from the start. And therefore, this is a very serious turn in, into what we call modern attitude. Right after Descartes, there, at almost at the same time, Spinoza also introduced into philosophy geometrical method. His main opus, his main book is Etica Modo Geometrico Demonstrata. Ethics demonstrated in a geometrical fashion. Of course, uh, to Hoji, uh, uh, always, whenever we talk about it, it's a matter of uh, clarity and uh, certainty. But to develop a pantheistic system based on geometrical method which was undertaken by Baruch Spinoza is, of course, an extraordinary way of approaching the question, for example, of morals and ethics. Spinoza, who belonged to the Jewish community in the beginning, was later anathematized, thrown out of the synagogue, cursed as an unbeliever, heretic, and what not. The third person to mention among the three is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, 1646 to 1716. Leibniz was a believer in God and from the very beginning the question occurred about the, pass the ability, the mode of creation. According to Leibniz, all reality is composed of so-called monads. Uncreated monad is God, and all the other monads are created and subject dependent on God. Monads do not interfere with each other, but every monad has an internal knowledge of the whole universe. Leibniz tried also to answer the question about the nature of this universe. And he insisted that the universe built or created by God is the best universe of all possible universes. For God, of course, the number of universes possible to exist is infinite. So when he created this universe, he must have had some special reason for doing it. This special reason is that the universe in which those monads 
exist, which make up this monad, those monads, infinite in number, is the best among possible universes. We know later on that this idea that the universe is the best possible universe was very much ridiculed by so-called encyclopedists. Diderot, Voltaire, D'Alembert, especially Voltaire, ridiculed this idea, pointing out the maladjustments and all the so-called evil present in this world. Leibniz therefore stands out in the sense that he was absolute defendant of the religious concept, the basic concept of a perfect all-good God who made a choice to create the best possible universe. Leibniz's view of the world can be summarized in the following way. All reality is made up of infinity of soul-like entities called monads. They are substances and they are ontologically independent only depending on God. They depend on God for their, their existence. Every monad is different from all, any other monad. Their independence consists in the fact that that all that is true can be deduced from the full concept of a monad or the essential nature of it. This best world is built, of course, and brought into existence by God, and it cannot con contain a contradiction. Each monad comes into existence from sheer possibility into actualized being. God shows every particular monad as an individual being, individual substance. Because all those monads in conception, all that they con uh, contain in their nascent, in their essences, is necessary. Monads are actualized and they are the reality that underlies all appearances and are systematically related to the monads because the appearances are well-founded phenomena. God cannot choose what is impossible. Any universe must include what is necessary. God chooses from among the possible pure essences that are not actualized. There must, however, be a sufficient reason for what God chooses if the universe is to be fully rationally explicable. The reason why God chooses 
to actualize some contingent possibilities rather than others can be found in the principle of non-contradiction. And of course, God's activity cannot contain a contradiction. It was already indicated in previous lectures that in a general way the trend of 17th, 18th and 19th centuries until 20th, the bent and trend of most not all, absolutely not all, but most philosophers, was towards empiricism. Empiricism uh, shall be discussed in connection with uh, Bishop Barclay and David Hume. Barclay, 1683 to 1753, and David Hume, 1711 to 1776. Both of them were radical empiricists. However, they came to very different visions of the universe. Barclay ended up with radical idealism. David Hume, on the other hand, being an atheist, ended with radical empiricism. The Humean sort of empiricism is really very difficult to distinguish from radical skepticism. If you mistake him really seriously, I repeat, if he is taken seriously, then of course there is no other way to interpret his philosophy but as a radical skepticism. And Hume exercised a very deep influence on philosophers who followed later on. With the appearance of Immanuel Kant, we have a gradual elimination of metaphysical thinking within the mainstream of European philosophy. By metaphysical thinking, of course, we understand the belief that the questions of immortality, nature